I'm Tom Periello, and you're watching Meet the Farmer TV. Next on Meet the Farmer TV, VICFA's Farm Food Voices and a special tribute to Katherine Russell. Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. In the Kitchen Magazine, serving the community and everyone who loves good food. Culpepper's Channel 21, helping to preserve the agricultural history of Virginia, and Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Now we're going to go see an annual event, VICFA's Farm Food Voices, where politicians, farmers, and a multimedia event where we learn more about local agriculture and the Virginia's independent Farmers and Consumers Association. Marugula to zucchini at the White House. Save the family farm. In the kitchen. In the end, the bill passed. It's about preserving some semblance of the family farm. And it's for locally grown food. It's about market access. Plants don't have personalities. I got one. <laughs> so I call it the new American agriculture. And our whole agriculture education system is going to change. We have a great solution to some of these uh, crises that we're now facing. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. Meet the Farmer TV. Now let's go and check out the displays, the chefs, the food samples, everything that's exciting about local food right here in this VICFA event. I think we have a winner. Winner, come on up. Wendy Gibson, congratulations. And here's your package. What color are the tickets? This is the wine and cheese package. And what color are the tickets? Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today to this wonderful event, the uh, fifth annual Farm Food Voices. This is actually the first time I've been here. My name is Rob Schilling. I have a radio show on WINA 1070 from noon to two, and we actually took an hour last week and promoted this event. We had Bill McCaskill and John Coles and Catherine Russell in the studio to talk about the importance of food freedom. And I want to thank Catherine for inviting me. And I really had a wonderful time meeting so many people today and certainly enjoying some great fresh and local food. I want to encourage you, first of all, if you're not already a member, to join VICFA. There is strength in numbers and there is weakness when there are few. It is a terrific investment in your future and I would encourage you to do that. The uh, mission statement for VICFA, it struck me and I just want to read it to you. Uh, it's very brief, but it says our purpose is to promote and preserve unregulated direct farmer to consumer trade that fosters availability of locally grown or home produced food products. Now that we've seen some of the food available here at this VICFA event, let's talk to some of the presenters. Well, here we are at the VICFA event 2009. This is the fifth annual yes. Farm right. Food Voices. Mm -hmm. right. So five years now, and this is the smallest turnout? No, it's the largest turnout, yeah, <laughs> okay. the largest turnout. So tell us about just how VICFA got started and and what happened and what this is, this is all about. And, I mean, there's a huge crowd here and all these restaurants and food. You'd yeah. think it had been going on for 100 years. John and I were in it from the beginning and uh, several other people. Joel Salatin was in it from the beginning. About five or six of us. And uh, since then, uh, we became incorporated in 2001. And since then, uh, it's all nonprofits, people play. You know, you know, we've gone through several presidents. Um, but after the first president, we kind of settled in and got our focus that we wanted to concentrate on uh, direct sales, farmer to consumer, with no regulation, because we think that there should be different tiers of regulation, that uh, we need more regulation when there's um, a resale involved. So um, that's when we started, and since 2001 we've been incorporated. Local food is, is in now, and it wasn't before. We've had too many food poisonings, and people are starting to see the big picture. You can regulate it all you want, but it's, that's a band-aid. Um, Isn't it interesting that these food poisonings have come from the very large operations that should be protecting yeah, us, but when they and we haven't gotten it from the, the little guys that are getting squeezed by yeah, the regulation? But when they put in more regulation, it affects across the board. Right. And what we need are exemptions so that we have a different uh, different set of regulations for when you're selling direct to the person's going to eat it. And so that, that's what we're trying to get. Yeah. Um, the Department of Agriculture is going to have a board meeting coming up today after tomorrow. And I'm going to propose to them that we have a meeting with the Commissioner of Agriculture and the Secretary of Agriculture regarding 
with local food movement. And uh, doing the same thing this will just be an informal announcement that we plan to do it, but uh, uh, in the future we're going to just send uh, them a letter and tell them this is officially what we would like to do is uh, talk with you about this, this movement because we need a two-tier system of regulation. And the way it is now, we, we as a small farm, can't really exist under the existing regulation. Yeah. So we're going to have an invitation saying, if you can't beat us, join us. Right. So we're going to be the ones asking them to join us for a change. Now that we've heard from some of the farmers and seen some of the food samples here at the Big Foot event, let's go check out the presentation. And I think the key is when you start looking at this, what is it really saying? Well, the first part is that it wants to promote unregulated direct farmer to consumer transactions. So that's the first thing. Let's tell people this is important. But the second part is, let us preserve it, which means and implies that it is under attack. And you wouldn't be here right now if you didn't know that were the case. And certainly, you've had to work very hard, including our next speaker and, uh, and John Coles and many of the others, to maintain food freedom. Food freedom is critical, and people need to be aware of that beyond the people that are producing. I kind of look at the situation as when you put a frog into a, a cold or cool pot of water and then slowly turn up the heat. Most people are not aware of the assault and then all of a sudden somebody's going to wake up and they're going to be telling you what you can grow in your own garden or they're going to be putting a tag on your goat or something to uh, track it through a national ID system and they're going to say, how did this happen? Well, it happened because there weren't enough people paying attention. I'm glad that you're here and that you're paying attention today. I love the creativity that has been spawned from some of the attacks, and I pr particularly bring up John Coles and Satterfield Farm when he was under attack for his cheese, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna sell it anymore. I'll give it away for donations. It's a shame that we have to do that, but it is brilliant that we have people who can think their way around the bureaucracy. And someday we may all have to be doing that. I hope it doesn't come to that point, but I applaud John for the, for the stand that he took. Don't interrupt right now. I'm talking, okay? okay? And now I want to introduce to you the next speaker, Richard Bean of Double H Farm, and he certainly lived through it, and he has stories of his own. Thanks so much. It's been an honor, really, uh, to be part of Vic Fuff since the day it was founded and uh, we've come so far and and today we need to give uh, Catherine Russell a great round of applause for such a great event. We got our ducks in a row this time, it's really been great and the turnout has been fantastic and the groundswell of support terrific. What I'm going to talk to you about today is sustaining the farm. How do you stay in business? How do you pay your bills? It's great to be a farmer, but if you can't sustain yourself, you aren't going to be farming very long. Double H Farm started in 1998 with my partner, Gene. And today, 2009, we're sustaining our farm. It's simply put, sell more than you Sell more than you spend. It sounds so easy, but you know it ain't easy. Where do you start? What kind of agricultural products do you want to produce? You need to think about what you want to do. Do you want to do animals? Do you want to do plants? Do you want to do vegetables? And sometimes you can't do what you want to do, but what you can do. We have so many new tools in our in our our farm tool chests that we never had before. Spinosad, mycorrhiza, humic acid, liquid fish fertilizers. These are great things and they won't hurt anything. They won't hurt the environment. You can do it. Together you can do it. You need to do it. We need farmers so desperately. But you have to sustain yourself. You have to survive. You have to work hard, you know that, that's given. But you got to think about what you're doing and what you're up against. Gene and I are doing it. Joel and Teresa are doing it. You can do it. You can farm. Thank you.
Remember, Richard will be out on the panel afterwards. After we have the movie, we'll have a dessert reception, coffee, and you can ask any questions you want to ask of any of the many panelists up here who are involved with local food advocacy, with food freedom. Uh, we're going to have fresh in just a few minutes. I want everyone to be reminded that the silent auction items, when we're all through with this, need to be come around and picked up at the credit card table. Just pick up your sheet and come there and check out. And we'll go up and tell these people to get rolling on the movie now. Don't forget to join Victor before you leave, and thank you for coming. Please welcome Richard Morris. You know, it, it reminded me of my childhood, uh, a time when people put effort into food. Uh, you don't see that as much anymore, although we're starting to see some, some trends uh, that are positive. Good food, real food, local food requires some effort. And it comes at a price. And you know what? It's a price that I'm happy to pay. Now, for those of you engaged in what is known as the dismal science, that's economics, you'll be happy to know that my family also uh, came out ahead economically because of our switch to whole and local foods. Our medical and living expenses decreased dramatically, while our ability to produce income increased. I mean, basically, it works like this. You feel good you're more productive, and you increase your potential for success in all areas. And that's what we discovered. Now, I have a favor to ask of every one of you in here. Two favors, actually. I'm greedy today. Number one is that I would like each and every one of you to take the opportunity within the next seven days to cook one meal for one person. I'm talking about one whole meal made from whole ingredients, something that, that you like, that, that this person you're cooking for likes, and put some, some effort and some love into it, and just cook that person a meal. Don't preach to them about whole food. Don't try to convert them. Just cook them a nice meal. Engage in some nice uh, conversation. Pretend you're French, and just spend some time uh, at this meal. That's number one. The other favor that I would like to ask you is join organizations like VICFA and the Weston A. Price uh, Foundation. There's a VICFA table out front that I saw because we need your help. Remember, there is strength in numbers. And if you can do this, you will help yourself, your children, and their children too. I'd like to close with just these three points. Think global, be vocal, eat local. Thank you. Um, the next person I get to introduce was the patron of our kitchen bill, which protects the right of people to make jam, jellies, and breads and sell them to their neighbors. This may not sound like a really important right, but I think it's highly symbolic. And, um, and our next speaker responded quickly and boldly to our request for help when this right was threatened in Virginia. So we're very pleased to welcome Cree Deeds. Thank, thanks so much, and thank you for what you do. Thank you for the, the strides you've made over the years in moving us toward a more localized agricultural economy. <coughs> 1996 was the first year Christine brought me a bill related to, 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 all, to local agriculture. You know, and, and I, it, there, there were issues that I'd never really considered until Christine just hammered these, these, these bills, and she said, there are three bills you want you to carry this year, and they're not going to make much take much time. I'll do all the work. All you have to do is introduce them. Well, for the next 60 days, Christine was in my office. I usually get to the office about 6.30 or 7 in the morning. I'm, I'm a, I grew up on a farm. I rise pretty early. And she was there shortly after I was and stayed most days, all day. She, Christine brought the bills to me because she said her delegate would not introduce them. He said he would only introduce a few bills, wouldn't introduce hers. So. I had those three bills, and, and, and all three of them, I, we, didn't, we, we didn't have luck with any of them. In fact, it took me a number of years of carrying bills for Christine because she sold me. She, she convinced me that, that, that it was the right course. It's, in 2005, we had a bill actually out on the floor of the Senate, and it died on a 2020 tie vote, and the lieutenant governor voted against us. And then in 2008, we finally got 
a small bill passed. That's small because in the grand scale of things, to be able to say you can sell your jellies or your bread um, isn't that big of a deal, or it shouldn't be. What This is a free market, right? This is America. But it, it is a big deal. And, and we, we, we were fighting, we were up against things we didn't know we were, we'd have to come back. It was then that I started taking my friend Christine and my friend Joel Salatin and lots of other folks, John Coles, lots of people that have come to see me over the years, a lot more seriously and started thinking about, um, about agriculture in a different way. I honestly believe that the systems, the work you're doing now, is going to go a long way toward a rejuvenation of rural economic development. You see, in the future, our food systems and our energy systems are both going to be driven by the lo by local economies. You are going to produce the food that drives the local economy. You're, I honestly think that while we are in a global marketplace, and that, that's, we're not going to reverse that. I think with certain food production, you, you will drive the local economy in, in respects that, that haven't been realized yet. Thanks so much. Victim is protecting your right to eat food grown in Central Virginia. And they're fighting probably um, harder than anybody else you'll ever meet to do this. So if you like to eat real food grown in your state, then it would be in your best interest to join this effort. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your enthusiastic support of local food communities and um, we're going to move on into the other room and eat, and um, then the evening will continue. Thank you. Now we caught up with a couple of politicians here. Let's go to those exclusive interviews with Tom Perriello and Cree Deeds. Tom, I know we've talked to you before as Meet the Farmer TV, but here we are today with, with really pulling a whole bunch of people together in an annual event. Tell me how what you're doing in government really relates to Farmers, small farms, local food, the sort of the, the remaking of our food system. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, VICFA does such a great job of bringing people together to be a voice for common sense, for good quality locally grown food. And I've just learned so much from all y'all, from the organization, from the meetings, and it's really exciting. I mean, sometimes we're doing a rear guard action just to protect against bad things happening. There was no uh, funding of NACE, for example, this year in the appropriations bill, which was good. We are trying to block this uh, food bill that went through last week, protect the small farmers and that. Unfortunately, on the House side, there was sort of a coming together of the liberal advocacy groups and the big ag uh, to defeat that, but we put up a good fight. Um, but there are also things to be excited about. I mean, I think when we're looking at uh, the green energy economy and moving away from these corporate bailouts that I've opposed, we're getting away from the bigger is better mentality really across our economy and starting to think again about community-based models. Mm -hmm. You know, what's so exciting to me about the green energy opportunities in Southern and Central Virginia is not just moving from, you know, oil to, say, canola oil. Mm -hmm. It's about keeping the, the value and money in the community. These ones that are working, these biorefineries, you go to the pump, 93 cents of every dollar you spend there stays in the community. So we're looking specifically for things that are not only new fuel sources, don't compete with food, locally owned and grown, uh, with that going back, with the, uh, with the farmers having a stake in it. You know, there's a, a poultry digester we're looking at out in one of our counties, um, and what's really important, they could probably get some venture capital to come in and fund it, but then all that profit's going to go out. So we're seeing this not just as a chance to kind of throw a few more table scraps at our farmers. We want to get back to farming being something that actually benefits farmers. We're looking at a repopulation of our rural communities. Now that may seem wide-eyed right now, but I think there are visionaries right now that are fighting for that vision, and you got this weird alliance of some pretty left and pretty right folks who really get it, and I think that that can be a powerful message. Well, I think there are two different problems that require two different solutions. The first problem is that the public, understandably, will overreact when they hear something scary. Well, what if my peanut butter is contaminated? Well, that's pretty scary. My kid might get sick and die. Now we have a news coverage and a, a, a corporate media that tends to, to, to thrive on fear and all that. The solution there, I think we need to do pub public education. We need to do our job of letting people know what is a rational risk, what's an irrational the second problem is that I think sometimes Big Ag sees an opportunity in that to use this sort of fear to put in regulations that will crush the smaller farmers and really protect the bigger farmers. You know, we have a real crisis right now with our dairy farmers, with where the price of milk is, a lot of things 
that were totally beyond the control of our farmers. Uh, we also have had uh, price uh, uh, reimbursement rates that haven't changed since 1978 for our dairy farmers. So obviously we want to get more support there to get through the tough times. On the other hand, some of the big dairy farmers are seeing who's shutting down. It's the small dairy operations that are shutting down. Uh, they can't afford to go two, three years of losses. They can't go another quarter. So oddly enough, we reconstituted the Dairy Caucus, bipartisan, up in Congress to try to deal with this crisis and look down the road. Suddenly you saw some of the bigger dairy elements kind of pulling back because maybe you see an opportunity to do that. So right now in our politics, when we have a debate like food safety, the only two voices are these consumer groups, which I think thrive on that uh, overreaction to headlines. And then you have big ag, which sometimes is a very different set of priorities than the small farmer does. What's great about VICFA and other groups like it, and there aren't a lot of groups like it, is presenting that third option, which is consumers who really get it and like locally grown high quality food, and farmers who get it because they're talking about that quality product and safety. You know, VICFA was one of the first, I think it was Catherine, to say, look, you know, if you buy bad sausage from, uh, from a local farmer, you know where to go. You get your accountability right up front. You don't need uh, the FDA or USDA to be part of it. If you go to a, a nameless grocery store to buy sausage, you want to know someone looked at it. So this idea of having the same set of regulations for locally grown food and corporate food doesn't uh, make sense. So I think if we fight on those levels, we really do go out and engage with the public, have conversations about what is and isn't you know, a rational risk, and then we kind of create a, a political counterbalance to the voices that tend to define agriculture. Um, you will see things change over time. But the other, I think, uh, element that's out there right now is a real kind of I think legitimate populist pushback on the bigger is better corporate mentality. You know, in our banking sector, it was the big banks that failed. Our local banks, most of them held strong. Most of them hadn't made the bad loans. They hadn't gone for the greedy overreaching. So when we go into cure banking, we don't want to punish our good local banks for what these big mega banks did and sort of betting on people failing, essentially. So I think there's a space right now in America that neither party has quite tapped into, folks who really want to get back to that decency and basic accountability uh, that you get in something like the locally grown food uh, movement. Well, I don't take money from lobbyists, which sets me apart right up front from a whole lot of folks uh, or corporate PACs. And so, you know, th there is that world. I also come out of grassroots organizing in the nonprofit sector. So I actually believe in the decency and integrity of people. I think the media and, and both political parties tend to bank on people being dumb and reactionary. And if you treat them with that kind of politics, it, the debate will be lowered to that level. But if you raise it up, I'll give you an example. I actually really want to support health care reform, but I also supported the idea of taking the month of August to go out and road test this with the American people. Let's get their input. Um, now, I've been doing that all year, but every time I meet with people, I get even better ideas about how to do it. So yes, this is a serious problem that's really crushing a lot of our middle class families, small business owners. A lot of farmers have a family member who does a second job just to get their health care coverage. I hear that all the time. Um, so we have some real flaws in the system. But let's actually trust that people are intelligent enough uh, to look beyond these 30 second scare tactics uh, from the insurance companies or the oil companies and have the debate. And what you see, I think, happening, for example, with the energy debate was, you know, the scary big money politics will always win the first news cycle and the second news cycle. But if you get out there and you make your case, uh, as I've tried to do to farmers on this, I understand why farmers are skeptical of this. And frankly, the first draft of the energy bill wasn't any good for farmers. But the last draft is one of the most exciting opportunities we've had for real value creation in our farms in generations, not the table scraps, the real entree stuff we're offering back to our farmers. But that's going to happen from going out and actually meeting with people. And farmers are a group that know to be skeptical of what they're getting from a 30-second spot. So I think the, the, there are no shortcuts. We've just got to go out and have the conversation. And you know what, sometimes I'll be wrong, and I'll figure that out from the conversations too. And you know, sometimes we can, we can so um, put, put the founding fathers on a pedestal. It was a pretty elite-driven politics back in the day. And, um, I think we've actually developed the technology in some ways to make it easier now. Um, Two-year election cycles, the money, all those are broken. I think we need fundamental overhaul. But you know what I find is a lot of politicians on both sides want to be in that echo chamber of D.C. Um, and they assume that if they talk to a trade association of farmers, they've talked to farmers. Well, 
you know, sometimes those farm groups do a pretty good job, and other times I come home and I hear something very different than what the trade associations are saying up in Washington. Um, so really there's no shortcut to going out and talking to people and listening. We should do a, a day on the farm together. Yeah, well, I'd like to really try to, to, to draw in that, that local face-to-face -face politics along with the local food. I think that'd be, be really great. good. Great. Well, thank That's you for what y'all do. All right, Cree, I'm Michael Clark. And, Cree Dees. And uh, we're here at the VICFA event. 2009. You've been a, a proponent of all of these special bills for so long and work with Christine and John and, and you've known Joel. Well, it's got to be about preserving the family farm. You know, it's got to be about preserving some semblance of, of our rural heritage. You know, 1999 I introduced legislation that became the most progressive incentive-based land conservation program in the country because riding up and down the valley I was just tired of seeing those last that last 40 acre that 40 acre field yield up that last crop of asphalt. Um, it's about preserving some semblance of the family farm. Now I understand bigger is better for some people, but it's about preserving the small family farm that, act that actually produces food that can be consumed locally. That, that's really what agriculture is all about. That's what rural heritage is about to me. Virginia was sort of founded on agriculture. We, yeah. we got here and, and Rolf discovered tobacco and, and so how do we get it back to the, the colony of agriculture, not the colony of big box stores? Well, well here's the thing, we don't, we, we're not gonna move back. I mean, I, I think we just have to be better. I think that we are going to move to a model where, uh, of agriculture where the, the, the small farm, the independent producer who can, can produce and sell food, food locally is, is going to be a model for local food production. I think in part popularized by books like, like The Omnivore's Dilemma. I think that the, the stars are just lining up right for, for an agricultural renaissance in Virginia. That there are also models of agriculture up in Falkir and Loudon and down and Augusta and, and Nelson and Albemarle that, that can be models for the rest, and, and Southwest Virginia, frankly, they, they can be models for the rest of the country. We're going to, we're, we're, we're going to revive agriculture right here in Virginia. Well, there you have it, another Meet the Farmer TV here at the VICFA annual event, Farm Food Voices. This episode of Meet the Farmer TV is dedicated to Catherine Russell, a fellow farmer and mentor and the coordinator of the VICFA event, who died tragically in a car accident shortly after this event. Join us next time for Ira Wallace of the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, saving seeds of heirloom varieties. Thanks for joining us for another Meet the Farmer TV. And please let each of our underwriters know you appreciate their support bringing you Meet the Farmer TV. Check out their websites and tell them personally you appreciate their support underwriting Meet the Farmer TV. Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. In the Kitchen Magazine, serving the community and everyone who loves good food. Culpepper's Channel 21, helping to preserve the agricultural history of Virginia. And Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.